that everybody who operates is an atomic lab. And they're squeezed into that's all going to come and really And they're giant cells. The American industry has proven that's exactly what they've had relative to the Japanese. They're kicking us in the ball every goddamn day. For the Japanese. We should see it. We say, God damn, we know we're better. So we can hang on to the same old view, get hammered one more time. We've had a business Vietnam, but they don't believe it yet. Okay? So what I want to do now is I want to show you some impressions that came out of my... Well, before I do, I'm going to put more comments. When you start addressing conquest, survival, and conquest, you begin to, two things begin to surface. The idea of evolution by natural selection. The winning and the conduct of the war. Now, I know that some of the stuff is challenged, but there are very interesting <coughs> points of view in there that are quite valid, like the conduct of the war. So if you blend these things together, pretty soon you're going to get insight to the right of the You can't know military history by only looking at military history. Now, I know you're all looking at this screen. It was a proof. We can all talk about another one. By an anonymity by Gertle in 1931, Kurt Gertle said, you cannot determine the consistency of a system within itself, or you can't determine the character and nature of a system within itself. So you just can't understand military history by only looking at military history. You gotta look at related kinds of things too. Now, military historian makes the exception to that. That's tough, that's life. Of course, they're still back in the 17th and 18th century. If they look and study some of this 20th century stuff, they'd understand this. Not only that, those ideas of Gerdel, Heisenberg, the Second Law, and many other people are gonna be applied today, or even pull the other guy's socks down if you do things a certain way. As a matter of fact, as I explained to the colonel back here, I did it. I ran the experiment on myself. Unwilling participant. I'll tell you, you never want to go through it. Very, very bad thing to go through. I'll talk to you about that later on. I was an unwilling participant. I didn't know it. I'm trying to tell you, these things are very, there's some very powerful stuff here. There's some things we found out in the 20th century we're still not applying. We still look back in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. I'd like to think we at least understand the 20th century before we depart into the 21st. And if you're going to say, well, Clausewitz is my model, Christ, that means you haven't gone beyond 1832. And some people don't realize they're using Clausewitz as their model. They're making a big mistake, even though they haven't read them. I can go up there, Jesus, Clausewitzian. They're very narrow lens, and meantime, they're getting cut to ribbons. I'm not just talking about clauses. I don't care whether you take John as your model or you take only Sun Tzu. There's other ways to look at it. Remember, we said we're looking for those variants crisscross among many of us. Okay? So, knowing that, then, here's an impression of that. Initial impression. Regardless, I'll let you read it. Now. Okay. Now, here's The underline, very important, the underscore. Let's hit the first one. You know what I'm saying? Variety and rapidity. You can avoid danger, diminish adverse effects from the transaction, gain leverage over them, etc. Why is that important? Very often you can understand how important it is when you turn the argument around, come in from the back side. Let's assume we didn't have variety and rapidity. What's that mean? It means you can't adapt and you become predictable. And in conflict, that's the worst position to be in where you can't adapt and you're predictable. The reason why you want variety and rapidity is it allows you to adapt and remain unpredictable with your adversary. Exclusion leverage. That's the reason why. So if you have a very narrow response repertoire, they're going to get wise to you pretty soon. They're going to kick you in the swans over and over again. Okay, and this one here, the second one, note that. Not only that, you're working with other people. So you're going to have to allow you, you're going to have to be able to cooperate with them and vice versa. Or what I call harmonize your activities. So you can have focus, you can have direction, you can gain leverage. If everybody wanders off on themselves, well, you got some max entropy or internal friction. The whole thing comes unglued, you can start to help as individuals. So without it, you're going to get leverage by. Other people who know how to. Oh, I should. And note this one. 
even if you have the harmony, you just can't sit there. You have these other three and let the world take care of you. You've got to take initiative. You know how I define initiative? Very simple. The ability to think and take action without being urged. The ability to think and take action without being urged. That's the key thing. Very simple. So these are very important qualities. Variety, affinity, harmony, and initiative. So put more simply, if you can get that, then that's going to permit you that. And later on, I'll show you how we can take these two things and put them together. Variety, affinity, harmony, and initiative. Guru. See how they play one or another, or how one works with the other. You can get a representation of the back toward the back, and the less we're going to be building up to that. So to give this initial impression, but when you get a feel for this kind of stuff. Everybody wants perfect movies. There are no perfect movies. In fact, I remember when I was out in Ellis, in the 50s, the guys had this so-called last ditch movie. Like, what if that doesn't work? What are you going to do? Die? You got your favorite maneuver. It didn't work. I said, that's a narrow guy. You better have a repertoire maneuver. It's that little camera. You can pull this son of a bitch apart. So if you only got one thing you can do and a guy gets wise, that's the end of the line for you after he gets wise. It's over. You can have. <laughs> for you people who are in communications, any communications people here? Nobody? Not people who use radio. If you have a narrow band radio, you can't examine the other bands, can you? If he's got a wide band, he can examine yours, plus he can operate the other stuff and be holding you and you don't even know it. Same thing. So it's like having variety for pity, it's like having a wide band filler, and the other guy has a narrow band filler. You want the wide band filler. And if you're only using closet, you've got a narrow band filler for which you're looking for world of conflict. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, with that in mind, now let's go through the history. I'm sure many of you read Sun. How many people read Sun Tzu? I'm sure a lot of you read Sun Tzu. And you'll get some arguments when you wrote the thing, or whether he or somebody else wrote it before him. I'm not going to go through all that. You know, 400 BC, 500 BC. I took the average around 400. But his theme, harmony. How many people saw that? In his very first chapter, what is he talking about? The citizens have to be in accord with the, the subjects have to be in accord with the rulers of the estate. They have to be in harmony with the rulers. In other words, if you can't get the people working with the rulers, you can't go to war. As a matter of fact, that's what the men did to us. They got us so we weren't in accord with one another, and we had to depart from that world there in Vietnam. Deception, and more than once, it's lace you. All war, this famous statement, is based on deception. We're going to look in that detail later on, how that plays with other stuff. And the idea of speed, rapidity, or swiftness of action. In fact, he says the essence of war is speed, rapidity, swiftness of action. Brings that out. And then, in a very indirect way, brings this thing what I call fluidity of action. Remember, he said an army should behave like water going downhill, seeking the crevices, the voids, the gaps, and strength against it. That's the fluidity here. Now, if you recall, when you first read the thing, you never read it before, the first thing you hear, you say, what's this guy saying? Look, he's saying some important stuff, but he's using these metaphors, analogies, and aphorisms. You've got to read it well pretty soon. This is sort of a poetic way of discussing conflict. In other words, the Chinese embed themselves in nature. <laughs> nature's Fluidity of action. Why? Three things you can advantage of. What do you get? One, gives you the opportunity to do what? Strength against weakness. One idea comes up. The idea of moving along paths of least resistance. And the third idea, fluid, is what? The idea of by being fluid, you're what? You're adapting. Adaptability. Strength against weakness, paths of least resistance, adaptability. All three of those things come out of fluid. So you take all these together, hard deception, swift like fluidity, then with those four together, you can play the so-called dispersion concentration game. Not just concentration, but also dispersion. So what do we have in our principles of war? Concentration, no dispersion. But Sun Tzu had both. How many people are infantrymen here? How would you like to take a bunch of guys, nice concentrated attack against machine gun and clean your ass out? It's concentrated. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Part of my little bit, I, yeah. So what about that? You know, we say, well, we got a caveat. When you keep caveat in your principle of concentration, pretty soon it has no meaning. I just as one example. Okay, then by playing all these together, you can generate what I call surprise and shock. Too often we treat in, surprise and input, and shock as input. I don't surprise you. You don't surprise me. I do serve. 
you can't keep up. You become surprised. Surprise is an output, not an input. It's a reaction. Because you couldn't keep up, you didn't pay attention, whatever the case may be, or you're overwhelmed by what was happening. The only difference between surprise and shock, I'll bring out later on, shock is just a hard form of surprise. It's also an output. You get paralyzed. It's not so hard. You can't cope. But they're both out. And they're both, I might add, in conflict with very desirable pictures to have the other guy have, not you. You don't surprise me. I am really surprised when you do certain things and I kind of react. I'm surprised. I'm quite shocked. Output. If you look at the principles of the world, they got them all screwed up. They got input mixed in with output. That's another bad thing about it. They can't even get the goddamn thing sorted out right. So you want to ask yourself, what kind of things do I do besides these, if I want to look at it in deeper sense later on, that permit me to get that thing we call surprise apparatus in words where he is not able to react or keep up with events so he can do the right kind of thing. Whether you want to call it surprise, if it's a softer form or a harder form, we call it shock. It's not, you don't give a shock action. It's a state of shock to put the guy in. So that's his thing. And his <coughs> strategy, you all heard this, it is programming these organizations, disposition, I mean, strengths, weaknesses, patterns of movement, etc. all those things. Not only that, he had in the last chapter, remember he talked about all the use of spies. In fact, he used the term double agents in his day. And we thought we invented it. Yeah, that was all the way back four or five hundred BC, talking about double agents. In fact, that was the most valuable agent, you recall. But get inside. Know your adversary. That's the thing. Know your enemy. Any way you can. As a result of that, then you can shape his perception of the world. So you can manipulate his plans and actions versus his strategies and tactics. Or undermine his plans and undermine his strategy. If you don't have this, how are you going to shape his perception? You can't do it. That's why it's important. And of course, obviously, you want to give him a rather incorrect or corrupt perception world so he can't cope. Then, attack any of plans as best possible. Or attack his strategy as best possible. Next best is drop his alliances. In other words, split him up. Another variation of one. Split him up. <coughs> Another variation of strength against weakness. Third best attack is army. In any case, before you attack his army, you want to do all the other things because then you put the army in what? A weakened condition so it comes unglued. And that attack city is only when there's no alternative. For anybody that's fighting city, I mean, they, ooh, that's mean stuff. When it was mean in his day, it still is today. Even though the instruments have changed. And then he talks about these chain and chain maneuvers as a basis of throwing your strength against his weaknesses. So it raises the question, what do we mean by chain? Well, I'll give you some gifted language here. You read into it. Though. Says, One's the ordinary, the other's the extraordinary. The chain is the ordinary, the chain is the extraordinary. So you can also think of the chain as being the direct, the chain as being the indirect. The chain is being the obvious, the chain is being the hidden. Chain is being a deception. Chain is being a surprise. Right. That's right. Two physical ways you think. Two different counties. In other words, it's the combination that permits you to get leverage. If you don't have the chain, then how are you going to be able to set up the chain? And if you're trying to use the chain to get him to expose himself, so you can run through that exposure. In other words, it's like a variation we call it a what? Anybody. Combined arms. What's the better virtue of combined arms in a physical sense? You use one arm, so a guy tries to defend himself against one arm, he makes him vulnerable to another arm, or vice versa. It may be a better term than combined arm, but I don't think we'll use them. It's suggest you that they're complementary arms. They're really talking complementary arms. Use one as acts as a chain to get his attention. As a result, by trying to deal with one, he makes himself vulnerable to another. So when you're using combined arms as a central plane, if you do it correctly, you're trying to change each. And desired outcome. You want to win a whole nine yards without fighting, so do anything without fighting. In any case, avoid a protracted war. You should see all the reasons why you want to avoid a protracted war. But then you've got to give my whole credit. He understood it. Obviously, the regime doesn't want a protracted war. But what about the people going against the regime? They can promote a protracted war, and the regime can't handle it. They're going to come unglued. You advise That's why it's the grill is a point to run a protracted war. If you run a protracted war, Christ to say the goddamn regime's corrupt and incompetent, can't even put these guys out. They're supposed to be tenanted. 
as old regime socks down, drop by drop, piece by piece. Remember, that's from the regime's viewpoint. Boy, the track is From the other guy's viewpoint, not the regime, out of part, hey, that's good. If they can't handle a little bear, it looks like they don't know how they're doing. Sir, clarification so I don't lose any. Comment on dispersion and concentration. I'll get into it deeper later on. Go ahead. Uh, looking at it, a view from a commander, if he concentrates his force, that implies mass. But if you look at it, concentrating forces, that could imply dispersion. That's a different. Yeah, we use a different. You didn't say force. You said forces. Yes, sir. But then you you directly said drew concentration oh. to the principles of war, or mass, and well, if you look at it, as well, a commander, well, you, you said principles of war, or mass. I didn't. So therefore, why use it then? You just use the term. I don't like concentration to me, you look at a commander, if you look at a concentration of forces, that implies maybe a mass, have, may, may, maybe a mass of the entire force or a dispersion. And that's what I'm wrong. I'm trying to call you no, That's all right. I, I prefer not to use the word concentration because of the excess baggage it carries to this day. It carries a lot of excess baggage. What's the virtue of multiple thrust, Mr. Ryan? Why do you want multiple trusts? What if everybody goes up in line together? I think we were just discussing it before we came in here, since you raised the point. If everybody moves together, four are all in line together, how if the whole line moves forward, how can you get the other guy's plane? You're just going to push his line back. You guys were going to tag his plane. No, I didn't push him back. That's casual. So you want these thrusts going in there. The guy's, wait a minute, you've got to find two. You're trying to get his plane. That's right. It's true you've got to find. It's not that you're trying to get it to find. The key thing is an exposed flank. And if I got a tempo a rhythm faster than my adversary and I penetrate, he doesn't know where the flanks are. You do. You're carving him up. He can't carve you up. The issue's not flanks, exposed flanks. Here. And so if you have a lot of ambiguity, deception, you're attacking, you're running them through there, they're going to pull them apart. Go look at the German campaigns, the Russian campaigns, etc., all those thrusts that are going in there. And then look at the reaction of the people. They come unglued. They don't know what the hell's going on. Very powerful. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, so I won't forget it. The initial initial plan for Normandy, they only had three thrusts going in there. Montgomery, to his credit, complained like hell. People get mad at Montgomery. Hey, wait a minute, this is very goddamn risky. He forced me to add two more. I had five going in there. Because what you do is you generate what? More and more ambiguity in the adversary's mind of what's going on. You slow down his tempo to respond to that, correct? Even on the spot, let alone the fact they had to, which we'll talk about later on, commit the second campaign, they locked up a lot of the Germans and bodies later. Very important. Okay. With that in mind, let's start stepping forward. Here, uh, here we have some. Early commands: Alexander, roughly around 300 BC; Anno, around 200; Belisarius, around 500 AD; Genghis Khan, around 1200; Hamelin, around 1400. That is just a very obvious one. But the key thing I'm trying to bring out: all these people seem, for the Red Sun Sewer number, consistent with his ideas. They're a very extraordinary command. However, there was a difference. <laughs> Western commands were more directly concerned with winning the battle, while the Eastern commands are close to the Sun Sewer intention. They wanted to have their adversary shattered even prior to battle, so they came totally in blue. <laughs> so you have to understand. Genghis Khan and Tamerlane had access to Sun Tzu's idea. Remember, they conquered the Chinese Empire, they had access to this. It's not surprising. And all of them, when they knew this turnaround, was going to change genes, they probably did here. Let's point out here what they were doing. So you tend to see that thing. Okay? <coughs> so then, look at that historical pattern. Let's keep in mind the idea of Sun Tzu. Let's see if we can find out those situations where this change gene game has been played. With a tactical theme. And a, uh, the grand tactical of the operation, we use that term today. First, let's look at the tactical theme, early tactical theme. And you'll notice I truncated it at 1400. The reason why I truncated it here is because of the weapon. And they talk about two kinds of troops light troops and heavy troops. We have those today. And look at the role of the light troops, and look how they interact with the heavy troops. And if you read that very carefully, what you're seeing, the light troops, in a sense, in some sense, sometimes are acting as a chain. With the heavy troops with the G, or it swings back the other way. You can see it right down here. It's a line of operation. Yes. So you use one. So a guy tries to defend himself against one, he's setting, setting himself up against the other. 
So in combination, they're able to play this game. So you employ the mover action, but the light action, the press action, the hammer action. There. And you see it all the way back. So in a sense, it's a chain key game. Okay, now let's go into battles. And here's the many of the CDs. Schematic, of course. Battle of Marathon. Where we had the Greeks up there, thinned out center and strong the wings going against the Persians. Tight up formation. The Persians pushed back the center, the wings came in, attacked the flanks, they tried to reorganize themselves to deal with it, come totally confused, of course, taken out. It's also an example of an early example of a double power plane here, double double scene. You see that whether they intended or not, there's a lot of argument that you can see what happened. Okay, then we see the Battle of Luke. Have the Spartans at the top here, and the team is making the time for the real commander of the Bonds. In fact, they were outnumbered on the two to one. Nobody did. He thinned out his sand right wing and refused them to pull them back, put a stronger troops in here, and so at the point of contact, he had strength against weakness. In other words, the other guy was weaker than he was, even though they had more troops. Of course, he was easy to get stretched out. And it's a single out on this team. Single out on the in fact, how many people read Little Hearts Strategy? I don't necessarily recommend it to you. But one of the things he said was that this is a good example of the Black Order. called the Black Order. You want to keep that in mind. You can't be thinking with that schematic in mind. That doesn't do it. But there is a good idea in it. You think about it, though. In the Soviets, particularly Mark Engel understood what it meant. Unequal and uneven distribution is the basic thing about it. If you remember, for you people, Sun Tzu even said it before these people. Remember what he said. He who tries to prepare and reinforce everywhere is everywhere weak. And later on, Frederick the Great said, he who defends everywhere defends nowhere. And Napoleon, another one. That's the concept. And that might be where they came up with the idea of concentrate. In other words, we can concentrate people because we don't want to. Right. Come out of it. You've got to be very careful when you do something like this. Or from it. There's another way of looking at it. In any case, moving on. The Battle of Luke. I mean, excuse me, the Battle of Arbel. Where we saw Alexander going against Darius, where he's greatly outnumbered. He put his weight over his right. And he made his attack in here. In the meantime, Darius and troops up and saw a weakness here. There was a gap in the front, so Alexander adjusted his stroke toward the gap, also in the direction of Darius. And <coughs> Darius the field, the troops saw that price of the Most of the And then, of course, then he went through the center and pulled him apart. So it's an inside out signal development. Okay? <coughs> now we look at this. Famous battle of Canaan. Here we have the Romans, who outnumbered the Carthaginians. And what they did, what the Camel did, is put the weakest troops forward here. And the Romans pushed them back. They had stronger troops, infantry and wings, heavy cavalry to the left, light cavalry to the right. And as they walked into the sack, they were in. Why, uh, the wings closed in. In the meantime, the Roman cavalry driven the, uh, excuse me, the cavalry driven the Roman cavalry off the field. They came back, and of course, they had to fight the battle of certain violation. So here they are trying to reorganize themselves out of the Union formation. Of course, they were spot. Depending upon who the count you read, well, the lost about 7,000 troops. The Romans, somewhere between 15,000 and 70,000. So it was a rather dramatic thing. Since, well, what's my point of all that? But those weren't concentrations, wasn't necessarily principle. Unequal distribution. You're talking about unequal distribution, you're talking about shrinking up some sectors, thinning out other sectors. So you actually, in a sense, have both the idea of dispersion and concentration here. Some areas are thinned out, other areas are concentrated. All of us are. And we'll see how as we come up to the present day. It's a very important idea. Unequal distribution is very important. Unequal distribution. Also, they talk about, even though they talk about moral factors, so far it really doesn't 
we don't get very deep insight into this, so we'll look a bit more at the present time. Okay. So moving forward, let's go to Genghis Khan and for us. <clears throat> Incidentally, you might think I misspelled this. It's in the books, it's spelled different. I don't know who's right. So I just spell it all different. <laughs> so here it's called Genghis Khan, otherwise Genghis Khan with a J, and he said uh, Genghis Khan with a G, and I don't know. So I didn't misspell it, just the way it is. Okay, key assembly. The idea that they had superior mobility and gratis, superior communication, superior intelligence. Where I'm talking about intelligence, I'm talking about the intelligence service, and superior leadership. So the kind we call by, what we call more today, by general intention. Instead of having detailed order, general intention was to be done. And global commanders and squad decide how it's going to be done. So we're very modern. So with these kinds of things, his theme, note all these kinds of things we're doing. In other words, literally trying to pull his atmosphere. He jumps with these propaganda and terror. He was a very clever boy. One of the things they would do, they, they had to take the city, which they didn't like to do. And it cost them a lot of troops, and they slaughtered all the people, except a few, and let those people go so you could tell the other city what's going to happen to them. But they didn't surrender them. So you see that that both communists are probably going to be there. Another thing they pull off is they want to take a city, they'd gather all the, the, the subjects out in outlying areas, and they'd march in front of the Mongol troops so that the city could defend itself and clean out their own people first. These were nice guys. <laughs> Now, let me give you an example here of a sense of the operate. They were not too concentrated. To say. They're almost always outnumbered by their adversaries. Look at this schematic. The date going into the Chrism Empire. In fact, that's not in Afghanistan area today. And we see here, take the scale of miles, for example. Just superimposed by the mountain. We find out they're coming in the front over 500 miles wide, 100,000 troops. We're in front of them. 500 miles. So they're spread out more than that. So they didn't, concentration didn't bother them too bad. Again, it's just a minute. The initial column here came in here, and they fought a lot of skirmishes on this front, and crap rolled them up with these certain guys, and they stretched their force out along the river. In the meantime, Genghis Khan commanded this column, finally all came together and conquered the whole first minute. All the they did almost all their campaign. So they were in this country as a And not on that. So raise a rather interesting question. What's going on here? Can we apply these ideas today? So raise a rather interesting question. Even though I don't know why the mom was able to move them all these scattered, they left them to be separate and detail. They did that. They pulled them over And we'll come up on an answer. We'll use some present day data to support that. I'll let you read this and I'll comment on it. If you have all these kinds of things, your adversary doesn't, you get inside his little loop, he doesn't get inside your. You know what he's about, he doesn't know what he's about. <coughs> As a matter of fact, the Mongols were so good, and they got so deep into their adversary, that they had done Genoa and Venice anywhere he was going on Genoa and Venice, and the Venetians didn't know anything about it. So outnumbered Mongols, the result, I create an impression by seeing him come out of nowhere, yet to get And it's all these things. Well, why were they able to operate this first? Because they understood the fundamental truth of this. That doesn't understand. If you can operate a faster tempo than your adversary, you can play this version concentration game in its widest possible sense. If you operate slower, you have to be concentrated, otherwise you're going to get torn to ribbons. Not only that, Rommel understood that. The British complained down in 1942 and 41 against Rommel. The Christ, they were too spread out. That's why the Rommel was beaten. Rommel sometimes were very spread out and sometimes contrary to too. But they didn't real, realize he's turning over his operations much rapidly, more rapidly than the British and falling them apart. How many people here read the Causeway? Anybody? You had to read Book 8, Chapter 9, where he has a long discussion about concentration and speed. In fact, he didn't understand it himself. He says, act with the utmost concentration. Later on, he said, it's the highest possible principle. Maybe that's why we got it as a principle of war. But it came out of closet. 
But then when he goes into discussion, he shows four exceptions <coughs> to this idea of concentration. Four exceptions. Well, if it's so it's a high principle, then why do you have the exception? Not only that, when he talks about speed, there's no exception. He says that to the utmost speed, at the utmost concentration, but the concentration is the highest principle. And then when you read between the lines of the concentration, if you can operate fast, you don't require to be concentrated. If that's the case, then the premier idea is speed, not concentration. Because with speed, you can play this version of concentration game. In fact, you use it in order to concentrate on your adversary. So where are our principles of order? We have the principle of speed. And that's what the models understood. They could operate. So what wrong with the other guys understood. And that's why if you can set up a tempo or pace faster than adversary, you can run these multiple thrusts in there. You can get the other guy's exposed line because they are exposed. He can't figure out what you're up to, so you're pulling his socks down. He's not pulling your socks down. So it gives you the facility to play this version of concentration game in its wide, widest possible sense by doing that. You can play dispersion against concentration like chain and chain too. In other words, you can think of it as a variation on chain and chain. Keep your guy so he doesn't know what you are. Go ahead, read. Okay, chapter 9. Probably we'll see right there. Yet earlier on, he says it's the highest possible principle. If he finds out he can't violate speed, but he can violate concentration, he tells me that speed's the highest principle. So that's an internal contradiction in his own goddamn treatise. You want to challenge me on it? I got the book right here, I'll show you. So people say they act with most concentration all the time, they say it's the highest principle. I say, well, and they don't, you know, they don't, they, I guess they're not too bad. Mentally or otherwise. That doesn't mean you don't operate concentrated somehow. Remember, I said you could play in chain and chain. And of course, that was part of the argument. I tend to use the word focus. So concentration is a, I tend to use the word focus rather than concentration, because I think concentration has too much excess baggage when we're So I think we ought to get away, get away from that goddamn idea of concentration with the excess baggage. Let's put a new word in there so we can define it the way we want. And some people want to call it focus of effort. I would say, well, why don't we use focus of effort? Thing? So we'd be sure that, you know, we can play in the widest possible sense. Give yourself more leverage against your adversary, deny him the opportunity of gaining leverage against you. Because people have, when you use a word, you know, they, they tend to interpret a certain way. They can, instead of actually giving you opportunity, it gives you constraint. And you want to design things so it gives you opportunity, not constraint, insofar as possible. So to follow that, sometimes our terminology constrains yeah. us because it is general. It, it, it may not, it may not be an intent to do it, but it's an accident. But as soon as you see it, you better correct it. If you don't, it's just going to go on and it's going to goddamn grind itself in deeper and deeper. I don't know. That's why I always worry about words. Sometimes I do it to myself. Hey, that's bullshit. All I'm doing is so I got to get rid of that. It's not something new. I don't know what it is right now. And you're always going to be doing it. <coughs> Things change. That's part of that variety of repetition. You know, you're changing. You have to learn how to do that. Okay. okay? With that in mind, let's move closer to the present. Go ahead. Last slide. This is the idea of terror. In other words, you're scaring your enemy down like a fool's good thing, and it starts to run into you. Sort of like the British did in the Falcons, and they said, we're bringing the girls and they're going to do bad things to the Argentinian contestants. Somewhere in your presentation, you're going to get to how we might use that today, given the Congressional rules in the game, the media covering every little bullet. Well, one of the things you can think you're getting at the models here is they terrorized people a long time ago. They actually showed up. Well, we've got things today called terrorists, as a matter of fact. Call them terrorists. You know. State sponsored terrorism, etc. And the gorillas use it very heavily. you got to be careful how you use all we're talking about later on. You don't want to, one thing you want to do, you want to know your adversary. If you use terror, you also may tend to actually goddamn build up as a result and cause you big problems there, too. In other words, you unify them against you. So if you're going to use that terror, you've got to understand how you're going to use it. Will it really pull them apart, or is it going to unify them against you? 
You just can't say, well, we're going to use terror. It may, it may blow back on you like you wish you never had had blow back on you. Even if you could do it. I mean, we have, right now we have a lot of constraints. I understand that. But even if you could, you still want to be very careful with this. You can blow back on it. And not only that, you have a different world. Remember, the world we talked about back in here, they could run an operation against some goddamn empire, some group nobody else even heard about it because they didn't have the communication. So by the time they heard it, it was already over, plus they could control it. Better today, with all the TV mass communication, you do something like this, you're in trouble. Remember, the world's changed. We've got to change whether we like it or not. If you can say, bullshit, I'm going to still do the same. You're still operating back in the earlier century. And you're going to get clean. You're going to get taken out. Sir, I, I think what he was suggesting was that uh, some of the things that the Mongols did, terror, propaganda, and so forth, are inconsistent with American values. Well, I understand that. Address? I understand that. And I will address that. Okay. If you're going to see, here's, here's the bad part. Go ahead. Look at the To me, so that needs to be very effective. Not necessarily. You mean to say, we can't do terror, we're predictable? There's many other, there's many other avenues you can operate on. And remember, if you use terror, remember, we put ourselves up in the world are being pure individuals. We've got our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, all that. So if we go against it, all you're going to do is you're going to alienate the rest of the world. Say, Those dirty bastards, they say one thing and they do another. And I'll get into that later on. That's a moral issue, and you get taken out on a moral issue if you do that. And that's the reason why you've got to be very careful. Yeah, my strategy, particularly my strategy, because I get into that moral issue. I don't get deep into it here, but my strategy, I get very deep into that. <laughs> and so if you say, I am this kind of a guy, you put, you know, television, TV, uh, people out there all the time, and then you do something different. How would you like it? If I were a friend of yours, or pretending to be a friend, and I'm trying to present myself one way, and I'm screwing you in the answer a different way. You would not have to, well, would you? Well, guess what? Nations are the same way. If you present yourself one way and start doing something else, you're going to alienate yourself from other people. We're the ones that Describe those values. Now, are we going to stick to it, or are we going to become terrorists? And we've got to erase all that goddamn stuff and get down to the gutter with those other bastards. <coughs> I have a long, my, my, no, my strategy pitch, I take that stuff head on. I lay it out and show you how the, the subtle twines are in, in deep trouble. But I'm giving you a hint of it right now. Do you like a person that promises one thing and delivers something else? What if I tell you one thing all the time when I'm doing something else? You wouldn't have much respect for me, would you? In a sense, that's what you're doing with a much sharper, harsher sense. Now, you may, it may be justified under very extreme circumstances. And you can justify it fine. But under, as a basis of operation, without those extreme circumstances, you're going to be in deep trouble. In other words, we, you know, thou shalt not kill. We don't believe that, except we go to war, we got to do it. But in the meantime, we understand we've got that written in, we have to do that. And we're only going to do that under very certain kind of circumstances. And if you're going to do terror, you're going to do that under very certain, certain kind of circumstances. And, and particularly the way we look at the world, we're going to be more constrained with that than many other people, as you already cited. But that doesn't mean we have to go to the town. Did I see another hand? No. Well, terror is also a word, sir, that carries a lot of excess baggage with it. That's correct. And uh, we're just trying to get inside the decision loop and create this confusion and chaos. And that can be regarded as a terror. That's a terror. If I get inside a guy's vision, he starts coming unglued. He's terrified. That's exactly what I was doing that morning. It's a case like in the fall when you the bridge. He said, we're bringing the Gurkhas around. I know, because people really <laughs> fear the Gurkhas. That's right. I understand. In front of the Latin. Latin mentality, maybe more than other kind of mentality. I don't know. Maybe I'm being racist. I shouldn't be. But my, my suspicion, from what I hear, I'm being American. I guess I'm being pre programmed. It's going to be more emotional. Okay. Battle of the Lake. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I just probably, since a later theorist used it, I want to bring it out. All it is is more modern Greek play. <laughs> Where Frederick the Great brought his in and roll up the uh, Austrian wing and brought it to the top here. Of course, he had sort of another operation going out here, so the chain operation going out here. So he was going to be successful with the whole amount. He was outnumbered almost two to one, so just in case of single development, there's some other findings. Okay. Uh, okay. 
Anybody want to take a five minute break or something? Yes, sir. It's a good time. Let's take about five minutes. Okay, now let's move on. Then. I guess we'll move on. Go well, closer to the present. 19th, uh, 18th century theoreticians. Here we see these people again, Sachs, Rosset, and Jeremy Pye. And the theme associated with plan of several branches primarily associated with Rosset. Mobility and fluidity of force, cohesion of the cohesion of force. And with these things, then they can play the so called dispersion concentration game. Napoleon played it very well in my day. We'll show you the way he played the dispersion concentration game. And this idea here, actually, a little hard brought it out. He, he brought it out by looking at uh, Rosset's stuff and also. Uh, by watching uh, or observing uh, uh, Sherman's operation in, uh, in the South. And so he was operating in line to threaten alternative objectives. He didn't understand his own concept. I point that out to him. He's been introduced by his book. Operating in line to threaten alternative objectives. The idea being you've got alternative direct and you operate in between. The guy doesn't know what you do, so he tends to defend both. So at the last moment, you have a large fraction of your force going against it. I mean, a uh, large fraction against your force going against a small fraction of the get strength against loot. In other words, you could have got a hundred. You know what he said? He says, deception. That's not deception. You're trying to deceive the guy. You're not trying to see. You want him to know. But you don't know where you're going. That's amb ambiguity. And they do. And that's what the things in multiple press are generating ambiguity. He's got all kinds of impressions in his mind. We'll point out later on. Mental friction. From mental entropy. So he can't cope. Hmm. In any case, contrary to direct artillery fire and key points, he of didn't have much indirect fire at that point. So. And he actually note these. I got the wrong chart first of all. How do I do that? Somehow I'm slipping underneath. Okay. So the problem is very familiar with these. You know what I'm saying? Very familiar with these ideas. And the idea, and here's the key thing, I don't know. Ambiguity, deception, rapid, easy movement. These are the ingredients you use to generate surprise. This is the input, that's the output. Ambiguity, deception, rapid movement, speed, rapidity. So these combinations permit the surprise. The other guy can't hold, can't keep up, so he becomes surprised. This is the action, this is the reaction. And look at his operation. But then the later campaign, let's see what happened when they're over there. And we as colonists, the Spanish and Russian guerrillas, using these same techniques help defeat we, the British, and the and the other people were printed in the holy. But there's another way I can present that, going back to my previous chart. The top's the same. I didn't change the top part to say. It looks like it's the same chart, isn't it? No, but I did. What is this? Plan of several branches. Isn't it a form of variety? Rapidity? Form of harmony? Dispersion of concentration? Right? Operating direct line? Etc. So, Napoleon's people were in the early campaign, exploit these ideas of variety, <laughs> rapidity, and harmony in order to generate ambiguity, second rapid, easy movement. And the second part is the one I want to really get your attention on. Exchange for writing in harmony for rigid uniformity. You want to get these guys in nice, neat columns and all that kind of stuff. What happens? You lose your ability to adapt, you also become what? And here's my point. When you talk about the idea of the sensor and these other people, they're at home with either regular or guerrilla work. Now, the reason why I bring that out, we very often try to uh, draw a big distinction between regular worker on the one hand and guerrilla worker on the other hand. I'm going to show you that they really they, they come together in many different ways, quickly to come down to the present. And so we'll be looking at both regular worker and guerrilla worker, particularly we go to the point of central, or deeper, deeper, and guerrilla worker, and other regular worker. So with that in mind, then what I want to look, now, look at now are what I call the three giants of the 19th century. First, the super practitioner, Napoleon, we'll get into more detail. Second, the philosopher on the work, the Klaus Wilson third, sometimes called the uh, uh, systemizer, uh, John. Klaus was primarily looking at the character and nature war, and John was looking at it from an operational viewpoint. But in any case, let's look at all three. Now, the reason why we want to look at all three, why do we want to do that anyway? Anybody think why we want to look at those three guys? Synthesize. That's one reason. Another reason, good reason. You want to see what ideas still hold. Remember, we're trying to search for that kind of stuff. What works, what doesn't work, can we use it today, etc. That's exactly right. So we're going to not just take the whole bag of goods and say, God damn, that cause it's a smart son of a bitch. That's going to be the lens source we're looking for. 
you got to pull it apart first, and then you put it back in. Pull zombie apart, closet apart, send two apart, and find those things that are, that are buried to hang together we can find them there. That's part of it. The other part thing is because it had such a pervasive influence on modern operation, and people don't even realize it, some of it good, some not good. So we want to pull it apart, find out what works, what doesn't work, so we can also do that synthesis. And a very pervasive influence on the way we look at the world. So with that in mind, let's look first at uh, Napoleon, the super practitioner. Look at Napoleon, you can find out here was the, what they, some people call Revolutionary Army gets given Napoleon. More on physical energy assists and so And we leave. Remember, the people are now going to get a piece of the action, so they got this moral on. They're really going to go for it, because they're going to be part of the game instead of being held down by the aristocracy and the internet, whether it be take. Okay, another concept that came up prior to Napoleon. The idea of subdividing an army, what we call it an individual concept. So they fight, which makes it much more flexible instrument. And of course, if you have that, remember, think of it this way. You have one rigid body going in very immobile. You got all these thrusts going here, you really start pulling the other guy apart. You get it as flying smooth. If you're rigid body, you can break the guy's flying smooth. Really. The main you have to be a good commander. Of course, Napoleon's a you know, good commander. And the idea of living off the countryside, traveling right. Traveling life. In other words, it's sort of a reaction against the 18th century where everybody had always survived. So if you live on the countryside, you're not pretty much fast pace. Remember, that's what the Mongols did. They just live out the countryside. It's going 56 and <coughs> And sometimes you see this in political rapid march, so it's 120 instead of standard seven steps per minute. I think it sounds like a contract for sure. <coughs> I'm not sure. <coughs> 